Today I wanted to introduce, uh, to start things off, one of the birds we've been working on recently, trying to help, uh, it, help it stop heading towards extinction. This bird is one of my absolute favourite birds, probably my top two favourite birds. It's a, it's a bird called the Regent Honey Eater. It's a critically endangered woodland bird that's found that was once found in flocks of thousands right across southeastern Australia. However, due to past habitat clearance and continuing, continuing habitat loss, including from the bushfires, which last year burnt several of the key breeding known nesting sites of Regent Honey Eaters, we estimate that the population of Regent Honey Eater is only around 350 birds left. So BirdLife Australia has been working on Regent Honey Eaters for probably the last 20 to 30 years, trying to make sure we, we, we halt that slide towards extinction. And I can report to you that um, I have good news. Uh, I can report to you that this year that um, as we come out of lockdown around Australia, there are more Regent Honey Eaters in the wild thanks to the work of BirdLife Australia and its partners than there were at the beginning of lockdown. And I'd just like to share with you a video of, um, uh, of uh, some of the recent work we've done, including a uh, capture, a, a, <clears throat> a release of captive bred birds from our partners at Taronga Zoo. So here we go with our first bit of uh, technological wizardry. So hopefully this will play for you. Now that was just a very brief, um, very short video of what uh, some of the work we've been doing with the captive uh, bread release. And it's part of a whole series of, of, um, of projects that we've been working on at BirdLife Australia with partners in New South Wales and Victoria in particular, uh, including um, covenanting properties for conservation purposes, to protect the best woodland left for Regent honey eaters, revegetating key sites, uh, removal of, of threat of birds that are threatening Regent honey eaters, and in, and also the um, the captive release. And to tell us more about that is somebody who was actually present at the captive release, and somebody who is is a great friend of BirdLife Australia. Uh, she actually got to um, release the the birds from the tent. Uh, she and, and that person, I'll just bring her on in a minute, is uh, Chris Bath, one of our most respected television journalists. You would have seen her around the uh, around the country on Channel Seven and, and on the Ten Network now, uh, bringing the news to you and uh, with the Sunday Night program. And currently, she appears occasionally on the project and hosts the Ten Weekend News Bulletin. Chris is also an enthusiastic convert to bird watching. And she's joining us now from her Birds Are Us, Birds Are Us farm in uh, the Lower Hunter Valley, just, just the road from where that Regent Honey Eater uh, release happened. So Chris, thank you so much for joining us today. And have you counted any Regent Honey Eaters yet? Well, I've got stringy barks in flower. Mm -hmm. I know that so I looked this morning, but sadly, no region honey eaters. <laughs> Would have been pretty excited if I'd said so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I imagine so. So um, you, you were at the, the captive release of those birds. Can you tell everybody what it was like to see the, these beautiful birds get go out into the wild for the first time? Yeah, a lovely way you said that I got to release them from the tent like I was camping with Regent Honey Eaters. <laughs> so I'm not sure I should explain what that means. So these these birds have been part of a captive breeding program in conjunction with uh, Taronga and BirdLife Australia and a bunch of government agencies. So there was a really big team that put this together and it was the culmination of a lot of work. 
it, it was kind of rushed through though because I know Mick Roderick, who's the woodland bird specialist for bird life up in the Hunter, uh, had found the perfect site that had everything happening. So it had great habitat for these birds to breed in. It had a lot of food and everything was flowering and it was going to be ongoing flowering. So they decided that they release these birds. So what they did was they, they brought them up from Taronga and they were in tents so that they could acclimatise to where they were. Obviously, it's a little bit further north of Sydney. So, and it was still reasonably cool. So they needed to make sure the birds were comfortable in the environment. So they were in tents, like big tents, not little tents, but reasonably. <laughs> um, and they could see in and out. So they they had feed that was being supplied to them from from Taronga and. They spent a few days just getting used to the sounds of the area and getting used to the environment and the temperature. And then once everybody thought that the birds were good to go and they were quite comfortable, basically what it involved for me was like, it was amazing a, to even see these birds because they're so rare. But to get up close and just see what jewels they are, the, the colours really surprised me. I don't think photography really does mm. them justice. There's brilliant gold on their wings and they're just gorgeous little birds. So basically we crept up to the tents and slowly unzip them and then gently put down the, the fly of the tent, so the, the, the screen of the tent so it didn't scare the birds and just step back very slowly. And I thought that they'd explode out of the tent. And instead I'm going, come on, freedom, go. <laughs> it just, and so they, they sort of slowly sort of, flew out of the tent and just flew off into the bush and then we spent a couple of hours trying to track them because I know Dean Ingwersen from BirdLife had painstakingly built almost like these transmitter backpacks so that you can imagine how light they were for, for a tiny little bird so that we could we could track the birds and, and see where they were going. So we spent a couple of hours sort of going through the bush and it was amazing to see them out in the wild, like on the on the bushes and hear them calling yeah. their call beautiful as well and again it took a while to get used to that because I know with bird watching one thing that I've learned is is that you you hear well you, you see with your ears basically you'll hear birds first before you see them most of the time and so there was this sort of strange call and I was looking at Mick and we're in the middle of the bush and I was going what's that and he said it's a region honey you know <laughs> well, I haven't heard it before <laughs> I've got quite a sweet call. So, yeah, it was it was an amazing thing to be part of and it was amazing to think that, you know, there's a real possibility that these birds could start boosting populations in, in New South Wales mm. at least. I mean, I guess that's the goal. When you, when you hear Gould talk about huge flocks of these birds back in the day, you just think, oh, what have we done? But, you yeah. know, I guess to survive, we, we, we really have to hang on to our woodland habitat. And unfortunately, that's where most of us are building in, in Australia. You know, we're building through all that dry, sclerophyll, beautiful woodland forest. And we've got to come to some sort of compromise so that we can retain the habitat so that, you know, it's great that we can boost the populations of these birds, but we've got to give them somewhere to live. Mm. And uh, also, uh, just for, for those at home, and, and I think you know this too, Chris, the the research team from BirdLife that spent months tracking the birds once they were released uh, managed to also locate, because of that tracking, some wild birds in the same area. And and we, uh, you do know this, Chris, because we did last week we, where we got the news that there's been at least three nests of wild regent honey eaters found by our researchers. That's why I can safely say there's going to be more regent honey eaters in the wild post lockdown than there were before. There's the the birds from the release that have survived and also these nests that we've discovered. And uh, it's just, it, it was such a thrill to find that out at the event that we're on, like literally, you know, it was all front page sort of news. And so they're around. Um, I can hear in, in your background, you, this for me today is like I'm going virtual birding and I hope everyone else is coming too. <laughs> I've been here in Melbourne in my 5K zone for, for so many months now and I've, I know all the birds personally. Uh, but I can hear, what can you hear some birds in the background there? Am, am I right? Is that an, uh, an oriole calling away? So we've had, I, I did my count this morning. Not, we, we had a bit of rain overnight, so everyone was a bit slow to get going this morning. So there <laughs> wasn't as much around. I was going, come on, where are the gang gangs? Where are the glossy blacks? You know, we had one gang gang turn up, but, you know, we usually have a lot more than that. But, yeah, there's been an oral calling all day. I think he's lonely, oh, wow. looking for love somewhere. 
Um, <laughs> there's firebirds you can hear in the background at the moment. Uh, near the house, we've got sort of a cleared area to try and make ourselves bushfire safe. I can sort of show you. Um, so this is sort of heaven here for noisy miners because they love this sort of habitat where there's cleared habitat trees, cleared habitat trees. So they're kind of the bully boys in my backyard. They scare everything else away. Um, they, they were having a bit of a war with blue-faced honey eaters before here. Um, and right. then if I, if I go over here, oh, here we go. Here's my wood ducks. So I don't know whether you can see them just beyond. They're there. I don't know. I'll try and get closer. Well, I, I don't know how to see yeah. camera around. No, no, that's... I'm... Hang on. I think I there can go. see. I... <laughs> here we go. Here we go. So that that's brilliant. So, you know, this is this is what we want from people from bed life. No. Um, to, to to send in what they see in their backyard or their local green space, wherever the local park, the local wetland, because all of this right across the country, we build up this jigsaw of, of, of birds. And you you spend your time between the farm and also when you're reading the news, you're you're in um, Sydney in an apartment. Uh, well, actually, I'm, doing... I'm commuting back to Sydney these days. I am. Um, thank you, COVID, but I've been living at the farm. <laughs> so, oh, excellent! Yeah, oh, you get yeah. to stop at the apartment just to do a bird camp from the balcony because you can. Well, I have to. Yeah, yeah. We, well, that's that's dominated by rainbow lorikeets and sulphur crested cockatoos, which are massive urban invaders in Sydney. Actually, to be honest, we we barely seen sulphur crested cockatoos here. We're about we're almost two hours north of Sydney, and this year we've seen more sulphur crested cockatoos here than ever before and more galahs than ever before so we usually have every other kind of cockatoo except those i'm scared that the sulphur crested's are going to dominate the hollows and and get rid of our beautiful gang gangs and our glossy blacks so because they seem to be a little bit more aggressive than yes. the gang gangs. so I'm, I'm hoping that they leave some room for our gang gangs to breed <laughs> It is. It's interesting. I, I know that your place is was very, very close and threatened for several weeks by the by the huge Gospers Mountain fire, and we've lost so much habitat that it's going to be a fascinating year to do the backyard bird count because we're getting all these birds moving around. Like perhaps the cockies that you're getting now might normally this time of year be breeding in the forest. Um, and you know, so this is. But we don't know that for sure. Uh, it's only with things like this where we get lots of surveys from all around the country that we'll be able to analyse what's happening and see how the impact of the bushfires affected the bird distribution and the bird numbers. Uh, we know we've lost a lot, but what about those survivors? So um, so I ask everyone, uh, if, you, if you're on a rural property, if you're on the edges of town or even in the middle of the city, please submit your, your counts. Even if you think it's, oh, I only get a couple of rainbow lorikeets, you know, noisy miners, sparrows, some, it's not that interesting. It actually is. We need all of those pixels to build up a great picture of what's happening, a snapshot of, of what's happening with our birds this year. So thank you, Chris, for joining us. It's been brilliant to, um, to speak to you. And I, I, what I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to make my own bird list from the background of noises I hear <laughs> from. <laughs> we cross to and see if we can get my backyard bird list. Um, I'm but sorry I couldn't get the rock stars going for you. you know, I could see if I can summon up the gang gangs, the glossy blacks and the lyre birds. They're kind of the rock stars around here. Oh, and yeah. it, it can be the officer teller, but, yeah, just, yeah, they're not here now. <laughs> well, and, and this is the thing, in the areas that are unburnt, all of those birds were really severely impacted. The the work of Australia after the bushfires to to assess the damage to the distribution, the uh, the impacts of the fires. Certainly lyrebirds for the first time ever may become threatened because of these fires and glossy blacks and gang gangs. So it's really important for us at BirdLife to find out where, the, where the survivors are so that we can start to plan how we help them recover as the bush regenerate. So thank you very much, Chris. It's, it's a brilliant way to kick off the day and thanks for your support. And uh, we will be, uh, enjoy the bird week. Enjoy I the will bird have camp. a good time, everyone. Thank you. That was that was Chris Bath, who um, who was a recent convert to birding in the last last few years because of her because of her son who who loved it and she she had to uh, had to get um, just 
was forced into becoming a bird nerd, but has embraced it and has been such a brilliant and wonderful supporter of BirdLife Australia.